Uh, let me get started. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to my talk on Hyperbus memory devices. My name is Vignesh. I am from Texas Instruments, India. Um, I mostly work on the Linux uh, SOC support for uh, Texas Instrument uh, devices. And I co-maintain the memory technology devices subsystem uh, in Linux, especially the common flash interface part and the hyperflash part of it. OK, uh, so this is the agenda of my talk today. So I'll start with Hyperbus, types of Hyperbus memories, Hyperbus protocol, the Hyperflash command set, the kernel framework for the Hyperflash, and uh, writing a controller driver, um, and what are the recent developments and uh, future enhancements that can be done for Hyperbus framework. OK, uh, so what is Hyperbus? Uh, Hyperbus is a serial bus. Uh, uh, nowadays, serial bus have multiple lines, so uh, that's that's a pretty uh, name definitions now. Uh, but uh, the, it's a high-speed bus connecting a Hyperbus memory device to the SOC or the controller. Uh, it has up to eight data lines, or it has exactly eight data lines, but uh, it works in double data rate. Uh, that is data is transferred on both uh, raising and falling edge of the clock. Um, it uses either a single-ended clock or differential clock depending on the voltage. If it's a 1.8 volt part, it'll use a single-ended clock, uh, sorry, a differential clock. Otherwise, it'll, it can just use a single-ended clock. Um, there is a chip select similar to a SPI bus uh, to select the memory device and a data strobe. Since this is a high-speed interface, uh, data strobes helps in uh, having a accurate data capture window for the host. Uh, there are two types of hyperburst memory devices today in the market. Uh, first one is a hyperflash, which is a persistent storage, uh, similar to spine or flashes. And there is hyper RAM, which is a, a pseudo-static RAM uh, for uh, read-write capabilities. Uh, mostly hyper hyperflash devices are used on embedded devices and not exactly on uh, server machines and et cetera. So uh, moving ahead, so as I said, Hyperflash is a non-technology-based device. So it is organized into sector and pages. Uh, a sector is the smallest erasable unit, whereas a page is the maximum amount of data that you can write in one transaction. So uh, since it's a eight-line bus working in DDR mode, so effectively, it's a 16-bit bus. That is, you can transfer 16-bit of data per clock. Uh, and therefore, the word size is also 16 bits. Uh, Hyperflash uh, only uses the data strobe for while reading. That is, only Hyperflash is able to toggle the data strobe line. And it doesn't ex expect host to toggle the data strobe line when it is writing data to the flash. Uh, I, uh, uh, it, it works at, le at least at 100, 200 megahertz frequency, so uh, you can get a read throughput of uh, about 400 megabytes per second because you are transferring two bytes per clock. So it's a pretty fast interface. And since it is a, a NOR technology-based device, there is very little setup that is required. And if you are using it for an instant on kind of applications and fast boot kind of a, uh, requirements. Uh, this is a very good uh, uh, storage media. Um, yeah. So uh, what Hyperflash does is uh, it kind of, it kind of uh, draws the features of the parallel NOR memories that are already there and kind of combines with serial memories to reduce the number of pins that are actually required to connect the device, uh, and therefore takes the best of the both kind of uh, analogy here. So uh, and this is. Uh, kind of a competitive technology for uh, octal spine or devices that are available today. So, um, Just a brief note about hyper RAM as well. So it is a, a pseudo-static RAM capable of having it, its own self-refresh uh, circuitry. And it is exactly uh, been compatible with an hyperflash device. For, but it uses a bi-directional data strobe. That is, if a host has to drive the data strobe when writing to the flash, and uh, device will drive the strobe when it when, when reading. Um, this is required because since RAM 
needs to be refreshed every now and then. It is quite possible that during a write, there may be a need for refresh, and you have to give that, uh, what you say, the uh, wait phase so that the device is refreshed, and then you can go ahead and do the write transaction. So uh, yeah, this is how uh, we can divide the transaction on a hyperbus. Basically, there are three phases, uh, command address phase, a uh, wait phase, and a uh, data phase. So in the command address phase, uh, it, it, is, uh, it indicates what type of transaction it is and what is the address to which this transaction is targeted to. So this is always driven by the master. This, this phase is always uh, driven by the master. And there is a wait phase where either host is waiting for the refresh to complete or host is waiting for the flash to start sending data and then a data phase, which depending on the transaction would either be from host side or the device side. So uh, just an example of how it would look on a bus, very similar to a spy transaction. Uh, you have chip select going down, followed by the command address phase here. Uh, since it's a DDR bus, you ju it just takes three cycle for um, eight, uh, six bytes of data to go out and then the flash responds with data here, and you can see that uh, read write uh, data stroke toggling to indicate the valid data window. Okay. So uh, to explain a bit what happens actually in the command address phase and what those 47 bits, rep uh, 48 bits represent. So the highest bit, the 47th bit, represents uh, whether it's a read transaction or a write transaction. The 46th bit represents whether this is a uh, uh, address that, that is targeting memory space or the register space. Uh, this is mostly used by hyper RAM, uh, where if you want to control the registers of the hyper RAM, then you would probably set uh, uh, one, uh, you would probably set the 46th bit one uh, to indicate it's targeting register space. Otherwise, it's all mostly zero uh, targeting the memory space or where exactly where, actual, where the actual data is stored. Uh, and uh, bit 45 represents whether it's a linear transaction or a wrapped transaction. Uh, wrapped transaction might, you know, you can wrap around the addresses at 16 byte, 32 byte, or 64 byte boundary based on the configuration that is done on the flash side. So this is useful in, you know, uh, filling up a cache line or something. So uh, then, uh, the actual address itself, so Hyperbus as of today supports 32-bit addressing. So you have address line 31, address bits A31 to A0, so of which A31 to A3 would map to, the 29 bits will map to bits 44 to 16, and there is a reserved bit range in the middle, which is 15 to uh, bit three, and then the last three bits are mapped to bits two to zero. So uh, there is a concept called half page, which is the size of the A2 to A0, which is 16 bytes. So uh, it depends on the flash, but uh, for example, on hyperflash, uh, these 16 bytes represents the smallest unit on which ECC is calculated. So if you want to enable ECC on hyperflash, you probably do read write uh, with 16 byte granularity. So uh, a bit about the programming sequence of how uh, software interacts with the flash itself. Um, so, uh, so hyperflash follows the common flash interface extended command set 002, uh, which is the same command set that most parallel NOR flashes by Cypress or legacy AMD flashes use. Uh, we already have a driver in kernel implementing this for a long time. So. Uh, you can find it under drivers, MTD chips, CFI, command set, dot C. So um, uh, the flash comes up in uh, read mode where it is possible for you to directly go and read the data on the flash. Uh, so going back here, so you just need to set bit 47 to one and then uh, bit 45 to linear mapping and then set the address bit and flash will start responding with the data. So 
a basic transaction will start uh, reading data from the flash. So it's very useful for uh, quick read uh, kind of applications. So. Yeah, so uh, programming uh, or writing to the flash or anything that modifies content on the flash uh, is a bit tricky. So uh, there are two step unlock uh, stage where you write uh, a predefined value to a predefined address uh, has step one and step two. So unlock one and unlock two, after which the flash is open for programming actually. So then you write, for example, this sequence is showing how to write uh, 512, 512 bytes of data to the flash. So in that case, the sector address to which you want to do the update, uh, you write value 0x25, which is the write to buffer command to the start of the sector address, and then tell how many bytes needs to be updated, and, actual, and then send the actual data. So this data is not actually directly returned to the flash. Instead, it's buffered within the flash first. And you have to issue a confirmation command, uh, the last step here, to the sector address so that the programming actually happens. And uh, the hyperflash supports up to 512 bytes of uh, buffering in this way. Again, all these addresses are 16-bit uh, word addresses and not actually the byte addresses that are being shown here. Okay, um, then Flash supports something called as uh, address space overlays. Basically, there are multiple parallel address spaces within the hyperflash. The default address space is where the actual data is stored. Uh, there are other address spaces like uh, device ID or common flash interface address space where there is a table which tells you about the actual device itself and its parameters. Uh, there is status registers address space and production bits which can be said to protect the individual sectors, and many more vendor-specific uh, address spaces may be present. So uh, there, there will be a specific set of sequences that will be given in a data sheet to uh, tell how to enter a specific address space. Once those commands are sent and you enter a specific address space, uh, even the whole entire flash will be replaced with the new address space. So reading data from same address would give you different data depending on which address space you are in. Uh, and uh, there is no need for separate commands for each and every uh, uh, register access. So uh, it will just become a serial address space overlay. So. So uh, moving on to the different types of uh, Hyperburst controller, we saw the flash part now onto the SOC part where the controller is. So there are, are two broad variety of Hyperburst controllers that we can see. Uh, the first one is dedicated Hyperburst controllers which only understand Hyperburst protocol and they, they can support memory mapped access to the flash wherein the entire flash can be accessed directly by CPU as if it's an uh, uh, SOC address. So. And there are uh, multi-IO serial controllers which support wide variety of uh, protocols, such as it can support a SpyNor, SpyNand, OctalSpy, or even a Hyperburst, et cetera. So uh, they may or may not have memory mapped access, but these are the two variety of uh, controllers that you can uh, see out there. Uh, this slide shows how a uh, MMIO-capable controller works. Uh, you can see that, uh, for example, on an SOC, uh, let's say for some, for, uh, sorry, let's say for example, at address eight followed by seven zeros to eight followed by all F, there is a memory map interface that is exposed to access the flash. So whenever CPU does a write access to this address range, the SOC interconnect would probably route it to the hyperburst memory controller. And the hyperburst memory controller in turn on the hyperburst will generate the required uh, command address, weight, and data state. So since it knows the, the transaction that is coming in is a read or a write transaction and the address range, 
So the 48 bits of the command address uh, phase where what, whether the 47th bit needs to be set or not will be decided by the hyperburst controller and uh, it can talk to the hyperflash. Uh, this is very useful uh, when, when if, you, if, if it needs to be used for XIP kind of use cases, although not something for Linux, but um, you can easily execute code out of uh, hyperflash memory. So uh, let's come to the main part, which is how this is supported in uh, Linux kernel and the software part of it. Um, Hyperverse framework is relatively no, new and it was merged in kernel 5.3. Uh, we for now only support Hyperflash uh, and HyperRAM is not supported at the moment uh, and support uh, MMI or capable Hyperburst controllers. And so most of the code is just a reuse of the existing uh, common flash framework. So on the top we have the MTD layer uh, which provides the user space and the uh, kernel level interfaces. And there is common flash interface driver which implements the parallel NOR command set required that, that is used by the hyper flash. Um, and below that there is map framework which was, uh, I mean, which is actually to uh, forward the request of uh, CFI layer onto the memory map capable uh, drivers. And, and Hyperburst framework kind of acts as a layer between the Hyperburst memory controller driver and the map framework forwarding the calls uh, from the map framework onto the Hyperburst uh, driver. And uh, at the lowest level, you have the hardware. So basically, uh, it's mostly a reuse of the command set driver and uh, giving a hook onto the uh, map framework so that the Hyperburst controller drivers can plug into it. So. Uh, there were a few modifications that need to be made to the CFI layer to support Hyperflash. Uh, one of them, uh, or the main one, is actually the uh, status register polling. Uh, in case of write or arrays, after the completion of write or arrays, there was a uh, there is a need to you know poll the flash to know whether the write or arrays operation is complete. The legacy CFI driver used to look at the data lines toggling uh, to determine whether or not the uh, programming is complete, but uh, it's not possible with the hyper, hyper flash kind of, uh, hyperburst kind of device where you have double data rate and, um, uh, and just eight IO lines for a 16 bit bus. So uh, the way it works in hyper flash is there is a dedicated uh, status register which you can go and read it to know whether the write or arrays is complete and it also provides a nice status saying, okay, what failed and why did it fail if, in case of failures. So, okay, if you're writing an hyperbus memory controller driver, so what needs to be done? Uh, it's a very simple interface as of now. So you have to uh, implement the hyperbus ops, which consists of these five functions. Um, I'll go through them in the next slide. So, so the f the first one is read 16, uh, which is used to read 16 bits of data in a single burst, and uh, mostly used to read from non-default address spaces such as ID or CFI space or the status register space. And then there is write 16, which is the complement of read 16, which is used to write 16 bit of data in a single burst. And there is copy from and copy to, which does the majority of writes and reads uh, of data from the actual flash memory array. If you are reading the data uh, from the flash, it, it, it's actually done by the copy from uh, interface. So uh, the reason for having this read 16 and write 16 is that uh, uh, the memory mapped controllers are capable of Although you, Hyperbus is a 16-bit bus, you are not supposed to do byte accesses. The memory map controller uh, device uh, drivers, sorry, memory map controller IPs are capable of, uh, you know, doing non-16-bit accesses as well. So, for example, if you try to write one byte of data, the controller might append 0x FF to the higher byte and make it a 16-bit write and write it onto the flash. This would be
be okay if you are writing to normal uh, flash memory space, but this would be a problem if, if the target was a status register or a configuration re register, for example, uh, where you want exactly the value that needs to be written. So uh, therefore, uh, read 16, write 16 must use proper I.O. accessors, which will do 16-bit accesses, whereas copy to and copy from uh, are OK to use non-default accesses as well um, and do the optimization that is required to read data from the flash. Finally, we have a utility for calibration, which is called very early on by the core code, uh, so that the, the hyperburst controller driver can calibrate uh, the controller itself. Because, because this is a very high-speed interface operating at 200 megahertz, most devices may have a phi and may need to calibrate a phi or have to calibrate some DLL locking or, or some of those stuff. So, uh, the, the core provides a calibration utility, which is called even before trying to detect the uh, flash device. Okay, so once uh, the driver implements the hyperbus ops itself, uh, for every hyperflash device that is discovered on the bus, you register a hyperbus device onto the core. So uh, this is the structure. Um, most important one would be the map info, which represents the start and end address and start address and the end address of the um, physical map where you can access the flash device, uh, followed by uh, the pointer to the node itself and the MTD struct, which gets populated uh, once the device is registered, and the hyperbus controller structure which will consist of the hyperbus ops. Uh, we also have a uh, enum for mem type. For now, we only support hyperflash, and this is just for future extension. Uh, once this is populated, you can just call hyperbus register device and register the device with the uh, core. So uh, this is a device tree representation for uh, TIAM64 uh, SOC's hyperbus controller node. Uh, there is a memory map window available at this range, and it is being uh, assigned to two, uh, two chip selects. So the chip select zero has 64 megabytes of data reserved and uh, megabytes of address space reserved, and chip select one has another 64 bytes of 64 megabytes of uh, address range reserved. So, yeah. Uh, and using the ranges, we map it to the uh, flash device, where the first entry here represents the chip select itself, and the second entry would represent the uh, start and the size of the flash. So the compatible uh, for hyperflash would be Cypress hyperflash, or it's also backward compatible with the CFI flash. Yeah. So I haven't, I haven't shown the second slave device, but uh, it will be exactly the same, but just the chip select set to one, so, yeah. Uh, how do you access uh, Hyperflash from user space? It's same as any other MTD device. So it exposes uh, slash dev slash MTD X to the user space or MTD block if you are using a block device uh, on top of it. So uh, you can use the MTD utils that are available on um, the infrared link and uh, yeah you can also use any of the flash file systems uh, such as ubifs so that uh, you can have a root fs onto the uh, hyperflash or any of the storage uh, yeah so one of the recent developments has been that uh, there has been a new uh, JDAC specification called extended spy specification or XXPI specification, uh, JEST251. So the aim of this document is actually to standardize the command set and programming of different serial flashes, uh, but it's kind of mix of all type of serial flashes out there and being put into a single specification. So. There are two profiles mentioned in the XXPI specification, which is profile one and profile two. So the profile one mostly talks about the regular spy devices, the spinor flashes, uh, up to octal, octal spy flashes. 
and uh, profile two talks about the hyperbus protocol itself so yeah uh, so uh, therefore now hyperflash is also an xxpi standard so uh, but if you really try to compare how these two protocol look uh, on the uh, with respect to each other so uh, the above diagram is of uh, spy flash protocol where you have one or two byte of command phase depending on if it's a ddr mode you'll have two byte of command phase or if it's a str mode there is a single byte of command phase followed by an address phase uh, it can be up to three to four bytes most likely four byte addressing uh, followed by a wait phase and data phase but uh, on the hyper uh, hyper bus protocol there is just a six byte combined command and address phase. And the problem is the address is kind of not divided among one of the bytes. It's, it, it spans all the way from the uh, you know, first byte to the sixth byte. So you can't really uh, divide this into two phases, but uh, the, the XSPA standard kind of adds another profile and says, okay, these two are uh, are almost uh, same in terms of the uh, uh, phases of transaction. So we do have XSPI compliant hyperflash devices on the market. So uh, such flashes will power up in spy mode, which is a uh, single bit mode, one uh, S, one S, one S. So one bit uh, command, uh, sorry, one wire command and one wire of uh, addressing and, and the one wire data phase also. So this is, backward compatible to any of the spy devices that we find in the market. Uh, but using that mode, you can program a bit in the configuration register, which will switch the flash over to the hyper flash mode. Uh, and then it will work with the normal uh, command address data phase kind of thing that I showed in the beginning. So uh, although one advantage of XSPI compliant flashes, they have the serial flash discoverable table or SFTP table, which has wide range of parameters and uh, things described about the flash that software can read in runtime and try to find out what needs to be done with this flash exactly without uh, actually knowing to know the exact part number and so on. Uh, everything is uh, discoverable on the fly. Uh, we still don't have support for XSPI or compliant flash or the flash controllers, which uh, can support both spy nor flashes as well as hyper flash devices. But uh, what we have today is we have a spy mem layer, which is an abstraction between the spy subsystem and the flash, spy flash memory devices. And it has been able to work with uh, any type of flash, spy NAND, spy nor, and so on. So, we could probably extend that to also support the hyperflash. Uh, so the the spy mem subsystem has a spy mem op template which uh, expects one byte of address, and, sorry, one byte of command and four byte of address and uh, followed by data. Uh, but hyperflash is slightly different that it has a combined command address phase of six bytes. Uh, we could probably add a new uh, member to the template saying, okay, this is an hyperflash mode, and then extend the command and address field so that you can accommodate the hyperflash protocol as well. Uh, uh, if you could do that, then it should be possible to use the Spinar core and the hyper, hyper, hyperburst core has is uh, with the SpyMem ops to, you know, uh, use a single controller driver to talk to both spy, uh, Spinar devices as well as hyperflash devices. Yeah, uh, these are the some of the enhancements that uh, can be done to the framework, which is uh, one of the thing is the write performance is quite slow uh, because the write is done at word granularity that is 16 bit at a time. So, but hyperflash can in general do 512 bytes buffered write at a time. So should be able to extend that. Uh, there's also a need to add DMA support for reading data from the flash, given that we can go up all the way to 400 megabytes per second. Um, using DMA would would be the only way to actually, you know, get that such high uh, throughput. Um, but the most flash file systems, such as UBFS and JFFS2, 
would use vmalloc buffers and we can't just pass around vmalloc buffers and try to map it and use it for dma that's 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 not possible because of various limitations so uh, that needs to be handled in hyperbus core or at the mtd layer level and yeah then probably extend the uh, controller itself uh, sorry probably extend the core itself to use the spy mem ops so that we can support multi protocol spy controllers as well as the xspi support for the uh, spy and hyperflash compatible devices okay so yeah that's it so these are some of the references uh, where you can find hyperbus specification hyperflash and hyperram data sheets and you can find the source of hyperbus core on the github uh, yeah, so thanks to my company, Texas Instruments, and the Linux Foundation for providing an opportunity to speak here. Uh, with that, uh, I open for question and answers. Uh, thanks, thanks all for attending. Any questions? Um, so uh, I saw your patches to the Linux and you with mailing lists. Thanks for them. Good work. Thank you. Um, you keep mentioning the UBE file system and basically UBE on the uh, empty on the hyperflash, but isn't the hyperflash kind of an uh, nor flash? So why would you run UBE on top of that? Why would you run UBI on top of that? Yeah. Wh why would you run uh, UBI on top of uh, parallel nor flash? Uh, well, you can run any of the file systems, but uh, you still need to do, uh, I mean, you don't need to do wear leveling kind of thing for, that is required for NAND, but it's still uh, erasing the same sector again and again and trying to use the same one is kind of not really good for so, NOR so, as well. <laughs> so the purpose is to uh, do the wear leveling, basically? Yeah. yeah. Okay, thanks. Yeah. So where, where is this subsystem living? Is it a direct under drivers, or is it under the current uh, uh, flash drivers? So, so it's here. Uh, yeah. It's under drivers MTD hyperbus. So it's under the hyper MTD framework. Hyper RAM, uh, we need a, you know, if there's a good use case, then we can start implementing, targeting the use case so that you really know that, I mean, just supporting in uh, out of the blue would probably not meet the requirement when somebody actually tries to use it. So that's, that's why I kind of haven't come to that part yet. Yes, yes, because there's absolutely no programming required actually, so uh, yeah. Uh, and uh, it's most likely that HyperRAM is uh, a supplement for people who are trying to use it on MCU side where HyperFlash would act as a storage and HyperRAM has a small amount of memory and it might be a single uh, multi-chip package which can be used uh, for such applications. So may not be a Linux use case, <laughs> never know. Uh, do you know which other vendors do um, provide Hyperbus on their devices? Sorry? Uh, I do you know get... other vendors who um, provide Hyperbus on their devices? Uh, vendors who provide Hyperbus in their SOCs? Yes. Uh, okay. There are uh, TI SOCs, TI uh, AM654 SOC, which has Hyperbus controller on it. And I know Renaissance ha also has a similar SOC. Yeah. Uh, did you compare the throughputs between uh, using octal spy mode and hyperbus? Uh, throughput in terms of throughput, you mean? Or yeah, I think you can use the uh, same controller with both correct protocols. Correct. So, did you compare the throughputs? Uh, 
no, I haven't done the benchmarking yet, no. Uh, even Octal's, we have Octal mode support, but Octal DDR mode support is still something that's missing in kernel as well, so we don't support the DDR mode, and Hyperverse is a DDR bus by default, so yeah, that's still pending to be done, yeah. Uh, but I would, theoretically, it seems like both are, both can operate at 200 megahertz and DDR, so, yeah, uh, it should be identical, if I, if I take a guess, yeah. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Okay, thanks, thanks, Wang Singh, thank you.